Right, so hello everyone, welcome to um, today's session. Today I'm going to be looking at radiometric dating, um, which is shorthand for how old is stuff and why does it matter? And so um, this is one of those issues that pops up in circles about evolution and creation and age of the earth and where it'll become from and all that jazz. And so that's a top why I wanted to cover it today. So I'm one of those big topics and it's one that um, yeah, I find interesting as well, um, as you'll see as we go along. All right, so the things we're gonna to cover today, we're gonna to talk about why does age matter? Like, why do we even care how old the earth is? Um, how does radiometric dating work? So it's mechanisms. Then we'll talk about a little bit of the philosophy and the underlying ideas that, um, um, you know, describe or explain how it's, how it's done. Um, then we'll have a specific look at carbon dating because that's um, more of a well-known one. And then I'll have a look at a, an example with um, Mount St. Helens eruption as well. All right, so let's start off with why should we care? And um, ultimately it often boils down to this. Uh, so current scientific theory and um, consensus dates the age of the earth about 4.5 billion years. And so they come up with this using a combination of radiometric dating and other modeling such as using um, geological strata, the layers of rocks in the earth and what, what we know about how rocks form and all that kind of jazz. And so this, this amount of time is important because it allows the time that's required for the evolution of new species to happen on Earth. Um, so last time we touched on evolution and how, um, you know, DNA, how it can mutate over time and how, um, you know, the theory is that if, if you do that for long enough, it can create new species and all that jazz. So that takes a lot of time. So obviously we need an old Earth for that to happen. And this, this also um, aligns with um, estimates for the Big Bang, which resulted in the universe as it is. So scientists have telescopes pointed out in space. They see the universe is expanding over time. And then they kind of use that expansion and think backwards and come up with a date of the universe, where it started in that centre. And they reckon that's about 15 billion years. And so for only about the last third or so of the universe, the Earth has come together and as dust and formed and life just spontaneously happened. And so that's this um, current scientific theory. Um, whereas a literal interpretation of the Bible is um, you know, you're probably all familiar with um, the account of creation in Genesis right at the beginning of the Bible in that God made the earth and the universe and all the things in seven days. And so, um, and not only that, the, the Bible also has genealogies, like literally entire family trees from Adam, the Adam, Adam and Eve, right through to Jesus, who we can be pretty sure who lived roughly 2000 years ago. And so that puts the date of the earth at about 6,000 to 10,000 years once you add up all those family trees. And so it's quite a bit of difference between 4.5 billion years and 10,000 years. That's, um, that, that's a big difference. And so um, I've talked about what the schools of thought are, but we still don't know why do we care? Why do we care? Well, why, why can't it be both? Or what, what's it even matter? Um, so there's two key reasons. The first one is, um, uh, so let, let's, let's say the account of um, Genesis, let's say it wasn't a literal seven days. Maybe it was each day was a billion years or something. Um, like people say that, you know, maybe the, the original Hebrew was like, um, you know, it wasn't literal language, maybe it's figurative for the, you know, the God taking a long time to build things, uh, make things, and then that would fit with what we know about um, the universe. Um, and so, yeah, maybe God took his time, but um, I know an issue I have with that is it makes his power seem limited, which isn't true. Um, he's certainly very patient. Um, I don't know, cool. I don't really mind how, how old the ground is underneath my feet. Um, but where I take, where I begin to take beef with some of these things is um, when evolution comes into play. Because for, evol for, because for humans to have come from evolution, there had to have been death before humans came into the world. You know, there would have been a bacteria and then the bacteria turned into jellyfish and a fish and then the lizard came out onto land, whatever it is in the family tree, all those things would have had to die through billions of years, lots of iterations and, um, mutations to to make humans as we are today and if that is true death would have arisen before humans um, but the bible teaches that humans um, brought sin into the world and it is only because of sin that death exists originally god had a perfect plan where things don't die and uh, we are now under the fall as a result of that first sin from adam and eve and so while i'm not too bothered about age if we start thinking evolution got us here um, that undermines the fact that humans caused death through their sin. And if sin isn't a problem, we don't need Jesus as a solution. 
And so what looks, um, what seems to be a little bit of a, you know, who cares, a little technicality, suddenly it starts to erode the very foundation of the Christian faith. And so that's where I take beef with this. And um, that's why we should care about the issue of time and how long things took to be here. And why would I care about Jesus? Um, that's what we touched on last week, because um, where you believe we came from, whether it was a random accident or we were lovingly made by a perfect God, and where we go when we die, if we're worm food or, you know, we have an eternal fate in heaven or hell, um, that's going to matter one day, obviously, if that's true, but also matters today because it drives every decision that we make and it drives how we live our lives now, whether we're, you know, um, explicitly realise that in our daily lives or not. And so, that gives, so that's why we care about old rocks and how old they are. So let's have a look at how we arrive at those ages. Um, so this is a view at how radiometric dating works. And so I start with lots of yellow things. These yellow things are unstable. They're slightly radioactive, or maybe lots of radioactive. Um, but radioactivity means, means that they're unstable. So they're like, you know, you know, they're, they're anxious. They want, they want to do something about it. And so what do they do? Well, they, they break down or they emit stuff. And so they might break down into a more stable um, object. So these little U's are uraniums. They might break down into um, PB, which is lead. Um, and once they break down into lead, they are now stable. They are now happy. And so they've released that anxiety. They're now happy now. So that can be splitting down. It could be releasing particles. It could be just releasing energy, but they're unstable for some reason. And eventually that they release that tension, if you will, as particles or energy. And so, so that's what makes radioactive things dangerous because those particles and energy coming off can hurt us. Um, but they're just, they're just trying to chill. They're just trying to relax. <laughs> and so how, how radiometric dating works is um, we can measure that radioactivity. You know, we have radioactivity meters, all that kind of jazz. And, um, and we know that um, this, radio, this radioactive breakdown happens at a certain rate. And so by measuring how much stuff has broken down, um, we can use that to kind of work backwards and think about um, how long that thing has been around doing its thing. So if a rock is formed, you know, in volcanic reaction or something, um, there's, there's a small amount of trace radioactive things there. Over time, they're anxious, they're gonna release energy and break down. And then we come to it, you know, hundreds of years later, whatever, measure how many things are still radioactive and still anxious and giving off things. And we can um, come up with a way to date things. And so I've got more information here at this link um, at Nature. Nature is like the scientific journal of um, goodness, the most respected thing in the world. So if you like to have a look at that, it has a lot of information about how radiometric dating works. All right, so if you're still struggling with that, I'll like to use popcorn as an example. Um, so you get pop your popcorn kernels, you put them in the microwave or on the stove, whatever you do. Um, even though they're all heated in the same way, um, they don't all pop at once. Um, so some are early poppers, they're going to go bang straight away. Um, others are going to take a while and some, some are terrible. They just sit at the bottom of the pack. They never pop and they break your teeth at the end. Um, so you can use this as a way of thinking about how things, um, you know, decay radioactively over time. So you can think about the kernels as being anxious things Then they release particles or energy, they pop and suddenly you have the popcorn. And so this happens in a, in a very predictable way. And so we, we describe this using what's called a half-life. And this is um, a term that's used to describe how long it takes for half of those things to pop off. And so the half-life of popcorn might be, um, what's that say, 10 seconds. And so after 10 seconds, maybe half of the popcorn in my bag is gonna pop. And what happens is after another half-life, after another 10 seconds, maybe half of the remaining popcorn will pop. So another, um, another quarter of the bag would pop. And so this keeps on happening at a predictable rate um, based on the half-life, which might be 10 seconds for popcorn, or in the case of carbon-14, 5,730 years. And so every substance has this unique half-life value that tells us how, long it how quickly it decays over time. Um, so you can see that uranium takes a long time, 4.5 billion years. Plenium 215, 0.0018 seconds. <laughs> and so um, this allows us to make predictions because we can have very accurate measurements of how long it takes for half of that thing to decay. You know, you just stare at it for long enough, wait for half of it to pop off. There's your half-life calculated, done. And so when we graph it, you can see like this graph here, it's like, um, it's like reverse exponential. Um, so half disappears and then half of that half, so that's a quarter and then half of that quarter is an eighth and then half that eighth is a sixteenth and so on and so forth. And so after a while, we've got a very, very small amount left that's still unstable, um, but it will continue to, um, you know, release radioactivity 
in that way. And again, more information at nature, it's that same link. It, it goes into this in a bit more detail. And so this half-life is key to how we um, do those actual measurements about those unstable compounds in things, in rocks or clay pots from Egypt, whatever it might be. All right, so bear with me. We'll look at some maths. This is the equation, teaching in physics. I call this the N equation because it is, has a high concentration of Ns. Um, I don't know why they did this, but they did. Um, so what do the N stand for? That is important. Um, so this N is how much stuff is left. So if I went to a rock or a T-Rex bone right now, I measured how much radioactive stuff is in it with my radioactivity gun or whatever they do. Um, and so that value will be here in this equation. And that, that amount will be equal to N times half to the power of N. So this first N is how much was there to begin with. So if I had a whole living T-Rex, um, how much radioactivity did it have? That's that value there. And then that's multiplied by half. Half is a number, it's one divided by two or 0 0.5 if you're a decimal. Um, then that's raised to the power of N and N is how many half-lives we've gone through. Um, so let's see if I can go back. So, so in this case, this would be N is one here, that's one half-life. And here N is two, that's two half-lives, N is three and so on and so forth. And so that might be seconds or years, depending on the substance. And so, so those who know a little bit about mass will know that if you take um, a number between zero and one, like this half here, and raise it to a power, you're multiplying a half by half by half by half, however many times, that number gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so this smallness is multiplied by the original thing, and that'll tell you how much is left of that original largeness due to its smallness over time. Hopefully that makes sense. I don't know, we'll, we'll keep looking at the next bit. And so, so this is like a well-established equation, well-measured. Um, we can measure like all of these things in a lot of detail. Um, but with that said, um, not all aspects of this um, formula are equal. And that is where I believe that we can hit some grief in terms of um, predicting ages and describing what we see um, going back. And so I've done some very mathematical and scientific ticking and red circling here. And I'm basically pretty happy with um, the first N because I just measure a rock and if I'm not sure, I measure it again. Um, so we can obviously measure that very, very accurately. Um, the number half is a number, numbers are cool, that's all good. Um, and so that half is because of the half-life aspect, it just halves over time. So we can, we can measure that and know that very accurately. And then N is um, how, how many half-lives there are. And so we can measure the half-life accurately, like I mentioned before, you just stare at something long enough until half of it's gone. There's your half-life, done. Um, so where we have trouble is this NO value. And so this is the original amount of radioactive substance present. And so if I want to find out how much, T um, how much um, radioactivity was in a T-Rex, I need a T-Rex, a living, breathing T-Rex right now. And he's probably not going to stand still long enough for you to measure his radioactivity. And so this is where I take beef. This is where things start to break down because we have to make assumptions about this number because we've never seen a T-Rex. How am I going to date the age of a T-Rex if I don't know how much radioactivity it should have in it? And so we make assumptions and we do our best with super science or some guesstimates. Um, but there's a problem with that because we have to make a whole bunch of assumptions. And I've listed like a small selection of those here today. And so I've listed these in order of certainty. And so what do we need to work out? Well, I need to work out like how big the dinosaur was to begin with, um, how, how much mass does a T-Rex have um, they're big, they're scary, um, they don't stand still on scales. Um, but we can like look at lizards or Komodo dragons or something and just scale it up and go, yeah, it's going to be five tons or whatever it is. And so that's an assumption, but yeah, we'll probably be in the ballpark given that we've got some lizardy things still crawling around on Earth today. And we can just, um, you know, scale it up based on their skeletons and what we see. Um, so in addition to that, we have to assume the amount of radioactive substance that has come or gone in the years since. So it's not T-Rex died and then I measured it last week. Um, you know, if, if it is in fact millions of years old, lots of things have happened to that bone. Even if it was buried, there's been ground um, water seeping through the ground and that water seeps through the bones. And so when we collect a fossil, um, that fossil is actually not the bone, it is a rock. Um, so what's happened is um, water has leached through the bones over time. And, we, and water picks up minerals from the rocks around it. And so the water actually kind of filters small pieces of rock into the bone. And over time, the bone rots away and we're left with a rock made up of those minerals in the shape of that bone. 
And so that's undergone a lot of changes in, you know, however many years, millions, whatever it might be. And so we're assuming that things are stable. They haven't changed when, you know, having water seeping through it with all sorts of radioactive, who knows what, could have well affected the amount of radioactivity that's in that T-Rex bone. And so we need to make assumptions or calibrations and adjustments about how much change has occurred in that, that bone or that rock, whatever it might be, over millions or billions of years as water seeps through it, carrying all sorts of other minerals and depositing them along the way. So we've guessed how big the T-Rex is. We don't really know how much radioactivity is filtered through it over time. Um, but then we need to estimate how much was in a radioactive T-Rex to start with, because uh, this is dependent on the environment. And so the amount of radioactivity in a T-Rex, or you and me, depends on what we eat. Like I'm drinking my water now, and this has radioactive T-Rex in it, a very small amount. Um, but you know, it's dispersed over all the earth and things. And so if I drink more water, I'm going to have more radioactive T-Rex in me. And so it's dependent on my diet, what I take in. And it's also dependent on what I give back out to my environment and fair what you will from that. Um, and so we need to come up with a reasonable estimate of radioactivity based on the ins and outs, you know, the diets and the things of the animals. And the problem with that is... Um, I have radioactive T-Rex in my water now, but my T-Rex probably didn't have radioactive T-Rex in its water. And so the world was very different back then when it was alive. And so we have to kind of guess as to whether the world had the same amount of radioactivity floating around back then. Was it more or less? Okay, well, what affects that? Well, the strength of the Earth's atmosphere and magnetic field affects that. Because um, solar radiation from the sun comes and hits um, um, carbon in, no, it comes and hits nitrogen in the atmosphere and converts that to carbon-14. And so the Earth's atmosphere would have had to have the same thickness, the same strength, and the magnetic field, which is always fluctuating, would have had to be similar. Um, and so that's really hard to make a prediction about how much radioactivity would have come because of radiation. And that depends on the chemistry of the Earth. There was meant to be some big oxygen event that started um, with plants and bacteria that allowed us to have the oxygen that we have today. Before that, there wasn't much oxygen in the air at all. And so the composition of the atmosphere and the oceans, whether they're acidic or, you know, other chemicals in there, that too would have affected the chemicals and their radioactivity and that sort of thing. And then there's physical movement too, tectonic activity, earthquakes, um, flooding, volcanoes, meteorites crashing into the earth, I don't know. So all this stuff could have happened in the earth over millions and billions of years. And so even knowing how much radioactivity in that T-Rex is a big glorified guess because there are just so many variables going on here. And that's if you estimated how big it was in the first place. And if you're sure that the, it's sitting in the ground over millions of years hasn't changed it as well. So, Mr. Red Circle N, there's a lot going on here. It's not just a number. There is a lot of um, assumption making and, um, you know, estimates that we have to make to kind of come up with these um, date ranges. And so this is exemplified with a story um, I heard from one of my colleagues. Um, so he has a friend that worked in a dating lab. Um, so he's a scientist, um, you know, and other scientists would send their rocks and they go, how old is this rock? And he'd go, I don't know, billions of years, whatever. Um, and interestingly enough, quite frequently, um, they would come up with um, dates that did not make sense. They would frequently baffle the scientists who sent them samples and going, that is not what I expected. How did you come up with that? And so um, potentially that lens, um, you know, that suggests that the, the um, process was not particularly... Um, you know, accurate and excellent. And so as a result of this, they introduced a new policy where anyone who wanted their rocks dated had to give a suggested range of a minimum and maximum of what they think it might be. And strangely enough, from that point forward, all of the dates given were in an um, expected range moving forward. So take from that what you will. That's a real story from a real dating lab. Um, through a friend of a friend, it's like cousin hearsay, but um, real world stuff. All right, so, so how do they kind of account for all these assumptions, all these variables, all these changes. Um, well, these days it's informed by a big word called uniformitarianism. And what that means is stuff kind of happens and changes the same, um, like the same rate. And so, so this is the idea that um, things have happened slowly over time in a nice, consistent, predictable manner. And we use that consistent predictability to um, help us to come up with um, these assumptions about the, the way we date things. And so this came about around 1830 by James Hutton and Charles Lyell. So this was an alternative to what was the previously um, big school of thought called catastrophism. And so that was the idea that volcanoes and things and floods and big things changed and happened things really quickly. Um, but Lyell's like, no, 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 it's cool. It happens nice and slowly and consistently over time. 
And, and this work, of course, went on as partial inspiration of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution later that century, because the timelines and that constant predictability, um, you know, allowed those theories to kind of proliferate and happen. So I've got a link here about Lyle. And interestingly enough, that link talks about the idea of where Lyle got his inspiration. Um, he was working with someone who was um, basically coming up with predictions and models based on what he knew from biblical events. And he was trying to correlate his scientific data with what he saw and knew from the Bible. And Lyle's like, that's silly. You're taking your ideas and then finding evidence for it. That's not right. That's not science. And so he took his idea that the Bible wasn't true and then went and made scientific theories about that. So um, I don't know. It kind of seems like the same thing to me. But I find it interesting that this came from a very anti-biblical school of thought right from the beginning. It's filtered through, trickled through, increased the, um, the, the, uh, the theorized ages of everything and inspired the theory of evolution, which also in turn uh, needs a long time. And both of these things um, are in opposite in opposition to some of the Bible's teachings. And so I, I found that interesting as well. All right. And so strangely enough, uniformitarianism, you know, it's served scientists well for a couple of hundred years. Um, but it's not perfect. We have some very quick processes that surprise us. They happen a lot faster than uniformitarianism um, suggests. And that kind of makes sense to me because I look out the window and I see a very dynamic world. I don't see a world that stays very static all the time. And so some quick examples of these are the 12 apostles. Um, so on the, on the, not from the Bible, um, the Great Ocean Road in Victoria, big rocks. Um, so they've been eroding quite quickly. They were discovered by, or well, found by Europeans in 1798. And there's only eight of them left. So I'm like, in a couple of years, we've lost a whole bunch of them. And they're apparently 20 million years old, according to scientific theory. That's what the tourism guys spruik. I haven't found a scientific paper for that. Um, but if they've been around for 20 million years and like four of them have fallen over in like the last 200, um, you know, that's evidence that that process is happening probably quicker. Um, you know, they're eroding quicker than one might expect based on uniformitarianism ideals. And there's a couple of other ones here too. These are links to articles you can go and see yourself later through that link. Um, so some scientists found that glaciers are erode land 100 times faster than previously assumed. Um, being wrong by 100 times is, is um, that, that's a lot. <laughs> um, but with that said, even if the Earth is 4.5 billion years and it's actually 100 times younger, we're still only talking 45 million years, right? So we're still not close to a biblical prediction of 10,000 years. Um, but it does demonstrate that things can happen a lot more quickly than our models and scientists are always changing their models based on evidence as they find things like this. And then the last example I have in the picture here, this is uh, supposed to be 36,000 years worth of stalactite growth, according to published literature about how fast they grow. And this happened in a basement that's 224 years old. It's a pub. They built it. There are now stalactites. It did not take 36,000 years to happen. So again, they're off by a factor of about 100 times there. And so um, the longer you kind of look into this stuff, the more you find examples of quick processes like this that kind of undermine some of the ideals and assumptions that are um, based on some of the things we've mentioned previously. All right, so I want to look at one specific example of um, dating, and that's carbon dating, because this is probably um, the most common one. Uh, so I mentioned four that before that different substances have a different half-life, some are really quick, some are really slow. And so um, a lot of people talk about carbon dating and radiometric dating like they're the same thing. It's like talking about an iPod instead of an MP3 player. It's just one type of MP3 player. Carbon dating is just one type of dating. And, um, and personally in Christian circles, I've heard people bagging on carbon dating saying, it can't measure the date of the earth and that's wrong and it's all a load of rubbish. And, and yes, they're right, but um, they risk um, sounding ignorant as a result of the following. And so I'll suggest that it's important for us to have a little bit of, um, a little bit of balance and understanding in, in what we say, because um, no, you can't measure the um, age of the earth with carbon dating, as I'll explain shortly. Um, but you shouldn't use that as a way to write off all types of dating and you shouldn't treat it as all types of dating. Because uh, if you're saying things and other people know a little bit about dating, um, they're just going to assume you don't know what you're talking about. That's going to shut down discussion. That's not what anyone wants. There's not going to be no real dialogue in the middle. No one's going to learn anything from the other person. We're just going to be yammering at each other and agreeing to disagree before we start. Um, so carbon dating is one type of dating. So it has a half-life that's short, 5,700 years. 
and to decay at this rate, even if the whole world was made of carbon-14, it would disappear to nothing in one million years. It would halve and half and half and half enough times in a million years that there'd be nothing left. And so obviously we can't use carbon-14 to date the age of the Earth because nothing is that big. None of that carbon will be left to date anything. Um, and so we use longer lasting substances. Potassium argon um, method tends to be one of the bigger ones. They have a much longer half-life. And so that tends to be used for the age of old rocks and that kind of thing. And so, so with that said, um, we do see some strange things like we find carbon-14 in coal. And coal is meant to take millions of years to form. And carbon-14 is meant to disappear in millions of years. So how does the carbon-14 get in the coal if the coal is in fact that old? And so I've got some links down here at the bottom um, uh, investigating this claim in a very detailed paper. It's like, I don't know, dozens of pages. It does my head in. Um, but if you're super keen, you can check that out. Um, but basically, um, um, like we need to come up with an explanation of why there's carbon-14 in coal. How, how does that happen if the carbon-14 is going to disappear in a million years and the coal is, coal is older than millions of years? And so either the carbon-14 got in there some other way, maybe it seeps through the groundwater, like I mentioned before, or maybe that coal can, in fact, um, you know, be produced faster. And so the scientific hypothesis is that coal is formed by sediments at the bottom of the water. And, you know, over time, they get buried by dirt and stuff and lots of heat and pressure and blah, 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 crushes it coal. So old dead dinosaurs now become coal and we can burn it in our cars. And um, yeah, we go flying on dead dinosaurs in airplanes, which is a bit weird to think. Um, but that takes lots of time and heat and pressure. Uh, but these days we can make coal and in fact diamonds, which are like super compressed coal. We can do that in a lab using like artificial pressure. And so it can be done quickly. Um, the question is how much time um, is required in an earth setting and you know, how much pressure and did it actually happen that way? And so um, there was actually a study, is that my next slide? No. Um, there was a study done by Pennsylvania University um, in 2003. So that's the one I've linked to. And they've, they're the ones that found the carbon-14 in the coal. So the coal was supposed to be dated at 37 to 318 million years. And they found carbon-14 in there, which should disappear in 1 million years. Um, so again, there's another question mark there. There's a little bit of evidence about some of the strange things going on. All right, so we've talked about radiometric dating and how it happens. We've talked about the ideology that underpins it and kind of forms those assumptions and just how many assumptions are required to do it. And we looked at carbon dating, which is just one specific example of that. Let's put it all together using the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. So volcano went boom, as volcanoes do. And so this caused a lot of changes to the surrounding landscape as volcanoes tend to do. And so this was like a hive of study for scientists. They love this stuff. Um, so once they know it's safe to go in there, they go in and they study and they get all excited. And so um, there were some new rocks formed by this eruption. So now lava comes out, lava comes out, cools, voila, new rock, baby rock. Um, and so this rock, you know, we know the date of the eruptions. We know exactly how old those rocks were. And so someone took those rocks and sent them off to a lab and goes, tell me how old these rocks are, mate. And they came up with, um, they came up with a date in the order of, I think it was, I haven't got it in my notes here, but it was like thousands and thousands of years, maybe even millions, and they're brand new rocks. And so it's like, uh, okay, so clearly the foundational assumptions underlying that dating process are flawed because they couldn't tell me that the new rock dated was, um, you know, one day old. They, they had this baseline assumption that it's just really old thousands of years or millions of years. And so, so that's, um, I've linked to that. That's a creation ministries one, a guy called um, Steve Austin, I think was his name. And so um, he, he did a lot of studies around these and he, he sent them off in order to kind of demonstrate that. And so there's lots of scientists that jumped up and down and go, oh, that process wasn't, um, you know, that process wasn't fair. Uh, they weren't designed to be applied to new rocks like that. And so that's why you got this wildly inaccurate answer. And my response to that is, well, how do you know when it is appropriate to apply um, the process to those rocks if you don't know how old they are to begin with? Um, isn't that the entire point of predicting? Like, we, how can we know how old it is before we even predict and then apply the right process based on an assumption about a thing, a thing we think we know already? It's, like, it's just like circular logic. And so... Um, poor application of science aside it demonstrates that it is not fit for all purposes there are assumptions built into that process and so in the, um in the um in the i don't know in the honor of fairness or whatever um i've i've forgotten the phrase uh, for fairness i've put a scientific criticism of this study here and so there's um a guy with a phd much smarter than me talking about things i don't always understand 
um, kind of critiquing that article. And so you're most welcome to go in there and dive that, look at the science and his um, scientific um, arguments that would seek to discredit that study that was published about those strange rocks. All right, so the next one is uniformitarianism. So the idea that things happen slowly and consistently over time. Um, as a result of this eruption, they saw crazy quick erosion. It's just like huge valleys carved out in, of stuff in no time at all. And so that was evidence that um, these processes can happen quickly and they can carve stuff away and they can certainly lay it down quickly too if you've got lots of mud, um, perhaps from like a global flood or something like that. And then lastly, um, oh, carbon-14. So, okay, so similar to the above and the coal, um, there was a suggestion that coal was actually produced from this... Um, um, from this eruption and so it caused lots of movements of water and all sorts of things trees got uprooted and smashed and basically this um this natural lake spontaneously formed and lots of trees and floaty stuff in the middle they all sank to the bottom with leaves and organic matter and the suggestion is that, that organic matter has already started to begin the processes of forming coal at the bottom of that natural lake in the order of what is that 40 years now um, so certainly not millions and millions and so all things um, considered, that's probably the weakest evidence here. It's been um, written off as coffee grounds on the bottom of the lake rather than rigid edge coal. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen the data. I haven't been there. I, I can't validate that. Um, but the suggestion is that coal has formed quickly. And again, there's another scientific article um, with a range of criticisms about that, if you like to see. And so one thing I'd like to mention with a lot of these samples is a lot of these resources are fairly inbred, as you notice. A lot of them are from Creation Ministries International and their affiliate research organisation, the CRI. And so um, I, liked, I looked for a range of sources to share with these and I'd love to do that, but um, they don't exist. Um, and rather than the evidence not existing, I think the reason for that is, is it's really hard to um, do scientific research for a living. Like I've done that for a living. It's really hard to get funding to do awesome things like curing cancer, let alone doing things that might be frowned upon, like um, trying to pr provide evidence that supports a biblical worldview. And so I'm not surprised that there's not a lot of evidence out there. I wish that there was more because I'd like to share a range of sources in order, you know, for fairness. And so you're not just hearing it from one person. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case here, but you can take it or leave it, see it as it is and investigate that for yourself with these links. All right, guys, so that's um, about all I wanted to cover today. So just to recap those quick points. Um, and so we looked at the idea of how radiometric um, um, dating happens. And while the scientific processes and measurements are quite reliable and consistent, the assumptions that go into those and fuel them are not. And so one example of these are assumptions based on uniformitarianism about how long things take. And these are just baked into just about everything now, including evolution. And so the origin of this had ideological grounds in opposition to a biblical worldview. So that's where it came from. And then lastly, we showed some um, examples of studies that challenge this old and slow paradigm. Some things can in fact happen quickly. And since we're talking about rocks, I want to finish with this verse, Isaiah 26, four, trust in the Lord always for the Lord God is the eternal rock, the rock that we can, um, build upon and be safe and not get washed away like the sand as he says in Matthew. And then right at the end, I've got the sources and links. They're all just in one place. So 10 links, you can go nuts, click through those and have a look and, and decide for yourself what you think is going on there. Uh, so appreciate your time and, um, and listening in guys. And I hope you get a lot out of that.